You're listening to episode number 10 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist, Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the show, everyone. Today, we will be digging into breakfast. Is it really the most important meal of the day? And if you skip it, what happens? What's all the buzz about protein at breakfast? Is a plate piled high with scrambled eggs better than a bowl of whole grain cereal? If you're curious about breakfast or you're just looking for some new recipe ideas, I've got you covered today with my guest, Lauren Harris Pincus. Lauren is a registered dietitian. She's a mom of two, and she's the author of The Protein Packed Breakfast Club. I'm actually giving away a copy, so please be sure to stop by lizeshealthytable.com and on my show notes page, I'll tell you how you can enter to win a copy. Now, as my listeners may know, maybe you're new to the show, and if you are, hello, welcome, or maybe you've been listening for 10 episodes, I've got two boys. So Josh is 22. He is in New York City. He has a job. He has his own apartment. I'm so excited for him. And Simon is 18. He graduated high school. He will be doing a gap year this year. But I share this because when they were younger and I had control, shall we say, over what they ate every day. I had this fruit first strategy that I used to use at breakfast, where the second the boys came down to eat, I would serve some sort of fruit. You know, most kids come down, they dig into their bowl of cereal. But I thought, you know what, it's hard for kids to get enough fruits and veggies into their day. So we're going to start with some sort of fruit. So they'd come down, And I would have sitting there a little bowl of berries or some sliced oranges, maybe a kiwi, half a banana, something just so they could kind of get started. And then I would serve up their usual breakfast. And that might be a bowl of whole grain cereal or a cheese omelet, pumpkin pancakes. I have a recipe actually on Liz's Healthy Table for maple pumpkin pancakes insanely great. Waffles. I used to buy these frozen waffles. They were a whole grain flaxseed waffle, so a little omega-3. And so then they'd have their usual breakfast, maybe with a glass of milk. So that was kind of how we navigated breakfast. Now they're older. Sometimes they sleep till noon. That would be on the weekends. Thank you. And so one of the questions I'm going to ask Lauren, you might be wondering it too, is... If your kids sleep in, say on the weekends, and they wake up at 10 o'clock or even noon, depending how old they are, does breakfast at noon really count as breakfast? Or did we miss breakfast that day and are we into lunch? So we're going to talk a little bit about timing today. You know, actually, I was in New Orleans a couple months ago. I was speaking at a conference, the Today's Dietitian Conference. My topic was on the benefit of family mealtime. I think we should do a podcast on that. And Lauren was there. She was talking about breakfast. And she really blew me away because Lauren knows the science behind breakfast. There's a lot of sort of conventional wisdom we hear about it, but she really knows the science. And science is important, right? And so she's going to dig in a little bit to the science, but we're not going to be too scientific, I promise. We're going to have a great conversation today. So anything you want to know about breakfast, we're going to answer it. Oh, and I've got a new recipe on the blog for savory oats with shiitake mushrooms, spinach, and eggs. And this is a breakfast recipe packed with protein. It's a kind of fun change of pace from your usual bowl of oatmeal. Because, you know, with oatmeal, we usually add fruit. We add brown sugar, things like that. And so it's a savory oatmeal. I'm going to share that recipe. And Lauren's got a bunch of recipes from her new cookbook, The Protein Packed Breakfast Club, and we'll ask her to kind of share some of her favorites or her kids' favorites. Anyway, before we get started, I have to thank my sponsors, because without them, of course, I could not bring you Liz's Healthy Table. So first up, Zespri Sun Gold Kiwi Fruit. This is a 
tropical sweet kiwi. It's yellow in color, right? We always think of kiwis as green. They are green, but sun golds are this beautiful yellow golden color. They are so sweet. We love to slice them in half and then scoop out the fruit with a spoon. And with sun golds, you can eat the skin. So just eat the whole thing. Why not? You can learn more at zesprikiwi.com. Lots of great recipes on their website. I also would love to thank Bush's Beans. You know, beans at breakfast. Let's talk about that. Have you ever made an omelet with black beans and cheddar cheese and salsa? Why not, right? You can get beans at breakfast. So check them out at bushbeans.com. And I'd also like to thank Super Healthy Kids. Superhealthykids.com. If you are looking for breakfast recipes, please head over to their website. They have dozens and actually have not counted, but probably hundreds of really awesome family-friendly recipes for breakfast. So head on over there. Anyway, why don't we dig in to today's topic of breakfast? Let's go ahead and welcome Lauren Harris Pincus to the show. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be at your healthy table today. Oh, why, thank you, Lauren. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) So, Lauren, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? And, you know, I told everybody you're a dietitian, you've got two kids, but give us the Lauren backstory. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, obviously, I'm a registered dietitian. I've been one for 22 years, so it's been a while, (laughs) done a whole bunch of different things and seen a lot. My true backstory is that I was a pretty heavy child, so I grew up dieting from minute one. I think I was heavy before kindergarten, so a lot of my childhood experiences shaped my views on nutrition and food. And, you know, fast forward, I dieted all through childhood, adolescence. I was at Weight Watchers with the adults when I was seven years old. I went to two, we called them fat camps at the time back in the day, not so politically correct now, but it was, you know, summer sleepaway camp for overweight kids. So that was two summers I spent there and eventually got to be a senior in high school. And I was old enough at that point to take control and say, I've had enough of this. I can't keep up with my friends. I can't do the physical activity I want to do. I want to be healthy and vibrant. And I want to go to college and start over where nobody knows me because people weren't very kind to overweight people back then. Still probably not, but it was even worse back then when there were way fewer overweight children. And I went on a very strict diet, which I would never recommend to anybody knowing what I know now, but it worked. And I lost probably close to 50 pounds at the time and went to college, became a registered dietitian. And that's sort of my quick version backstory. But it made me very, very aware of how important it is to eat healthy and exercise starting in childhood. Wow. So you can really relate to people's challenges of weight control and good nutrition. You know, you come at it, I come at it from a kid who grew up with a mom who had a home ec degree and always, always, always cooked, right? So family meals is kind of like my bent. You grew up with a personal challenge and your relationship with food would have been a really different relationship, say, than I would have had. So I can't look at it through your lens at all. And I really kind of respect you for that. And I know when you plan meals, you plan them with kind of calories in mind, balance in mind, right? Nutrition in mind. So let's start with breakfast. You know, is it from your perspective as a dietitian and somebody who personally battled your body weight early on, is breakfast really the most important meal of the day? It really is. Yay. Uh, (laughs) And I know why. (laughs) Tell us why. Really, in a nutshell, I would say breakfast is the most important meal of the day because research shows us that those who eat breakfast have better metabolic outcomes in the long run. And we're not necessarily talking about weight loss, but other important things like blood sugar control and heart disease risk. Tell me more. When you say, like, why would eating breakfast be good for your body weight and good for your heart? Like, what's the connection there? Okay, well, this is about as scientific as I'll try and get in this conversation. But the American Heart Association released a paper in February of 2017, so pretty recently, about meal timing and frequency 
and the implications for cardiovascular disease and prevention. And I'll quote it directly just so that it's exact. And it said that epidemiological studies provide strong evidence of a relation between breakfast skipping and cardiometabolic risk, including greater risk of overweight, obesity, metabolic risk profile, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. And these risks seem to be independent of differences in diet quality between breakfast eaters and non-consumers of breakfast. So basically, skipping breakfast appears to increase the risk of all of these lifestyle diseases that we're trying to prevent in ourselves and our kids. Is it because if you skip breakfast by 10 o'clock, you're starving and you grab for that donut? I mean, that's kind of the conventional wisdom. Why would skipping breakfast lead to it sounds like so disastrous (laughs) just from skipping breakfast? You know what? I think there's many, many components to this. And we know that people who consume breakfast and eat carbohydrates at breakfast have better carbohydrate metabolism throughout the day. For example, for those with diabetes, that's very important. So there's just many metabolic interactions and processes that occur in our bodies. And it just seems to be that when you start with breakfast, everything runs better. You know, there was a study that I quoted, and I'm not going to go too far into it, but I quoted it in the presentation that you saw at Today's Dietitian in New Orleans. And it was a study where they fed people the same exact food. And all they did was they flipped the breakfast and dinner meals. So some people ate more in the morning and less in the evening and vice versa, but the same exact food, same exact number of calories. And the people who ate more in the morning lost more weight, had lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar, lower triglycerides, all those things. And it was the same exact food and same exact calories. So, so, so you're the saying only like explanation it, is that eating it for breakfast, just we have better metabolic outcomes the way our bodies handle the food. So it almost kind of jump starts us. If we have breakfast, it gets our bodies going. It jump starts us, and it says to our bodies, "Get it going. Start metabolizing food, breaking it down. Let's get the day going." And so it just seems like such a basic thing: eat breakfast, right? It is. I always use, especially for kids because they understand it, I use the car metaphor. So we need food the way the car needs gasoline. And you would never expect your car to leave the garage with no gasoline and actually drive, right? But we expect ourselves to leave our food tank empty and go about our mornings when we skip breakfast. And our bodies don't like that. So they have to respond to that when we're asking them to perform without fuel. So we are not meant to fuel our bodies in the garage at night when we're sitting on the couch. We don't need the food at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night when we're sitting on the couch doing no activity. We need it in the morning when we're starting our day and sitting in school or at work and trying to perform. And we tend to shift it and eat more in the evening, which causes a whole host of metabolic problems. So the kid who or the child who eats breakfast in the morning, do they do better in school? Do they end up performing better at the playground, you know, having more energy to run around. Is that really true? It is true. So multiple studies have actually demonstrated the cognitive benefits of eating breakfast, like improved memory recall time, improved grades, and higher test scores. So when you put it simply, when your tummy isn't growling, it's a lot easier to concentrate and focus in school. That totally makes sense. But here's the thing for me. When I wake up in the morning, I have to have my cup of coffee. And I don't eat breakfast right away. So my husband wakes up, he has his coffee, he has his bowl of cereal with yogurt and fruit. He's like completely a creature of habit. And he gets on my case and he says, why don't you eat the first minute you wake up in the morning? And I say, I have to have my coffee first. And then I eat breakfast. It's what my body craves. Is that okay? Well, I don't think there's anybody who says that you need to eat breakfast immediately when you wake up. If you remember from the presentation, there was a lot of controversy about the actual definition of breakfast. And I think that as long as you eat something within two hours of waking, that seems to be the consensus of what one would consider 
breakfast, along with a host of other, you know, qualifying factors of what to include. But for timing, it doesn't need to be the minute you wake up. It seems to be within two hours is appropriate. So if your child sleeps till noon and you've got teenagers, <laughs> so I know you can relate to this. Yes. I'm always amazed by that. I don't think I've slept till noon ever in my life, but maybe when I was a teenager, I just don't remember. So if your teenager sleeps till noon and then they wake up and they eat, you know, half an hour, an hour later, is that breakfast or lunch? Or does it not even really matter at that point? <laughs> I think at that point it doesn't matter, but we're not really talking about their every single day routine because that's more like a shift work schedule, you know, mm. if, if they were an adult, right, where they would be working a late shift and then sleeping late, which is a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but, you know, they're likely not doing it every day. So if it's on the weekends, they're shifted likely. So I'm not as worried about that. I'm more worried about the days where they're required to perform in school on a regular basis. Makes sense. Hey, before we dig into the whole issue of protein, because that is so hot right now, tell everybody a little bit about your new cookbook. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm very passionate about breakfast. It's sort of been my pet project for so many years because as a dietitian in private practice for a couple of decades, the most common issue people have is they don't know what to eat for breakfast. They have no idea. You know, when you do a dietary recall, when you have you patients, you say, okay, tell me what you eat in a day just to get an idea of, of where they are. And I usually get coffee, bagel, or nothing is for the most part what I hear. And we know from all of the research that we have that that's really not what our bodies need to get going in the morning. So I created this resource for my patients, but for all the other dietitians too, who just really needed something to share with their patients and also the general public because protein is a pretty hot button topic right now, good or bad, however you want to look at it. I think we're going to talk a little bit about protein distribution, but it's not that the more protein is better. It's that you have to understand how best to consume it to give your body what it needs. So your book is The Protein Packed Breakfast Club, and Breakfast. we are giving away a copy. So head on over to lizishealthytable.com to the show notes, and then you can enter there. So let's talk about protein. You're saying it's not like you have to just pack on the protein in the morning. You have to distribute it throughout the day. What do you mean by that? Because most people eat tons of protein at dinner, but if you're having a bagel and a cup of coffee for breakfast, there's like no protein there at all. Right. And the reason that's a problem is that as adults, we start to lose muscle mass as we age. Okay. And, and not Ooh, old either. We're talking, you know, 30s. You start to lose muscle mass every year, which means there's less muscle, more fat, and your metabolism starts to slow. And basically, that's not only a weight issue, but it's a safety risk. You know, you want to keep that skeletal integrity as you age. So for adults, the research suggests a minimum of about 20 grams of protein at breakfast to prevent this muscle loss as we age or to minimize it. Optimally, 25 to 30 grams for what we call muscle synthesis and repair. So like after you exercise and you want to build that muscle and repair what you've stressed out, 25 to 30 grams optimally. Any more than that, and you're not going to utilize it for that purpose. We kind of have a limit, threshold, of what your body can really use that protein for. You'll use it as calories or for other processes, but if you're really looking at building and preserving muscle, that 25 to 30 grams at a time is the limit. And that's an average of about four ounces of protein if you needed to qualify that. Mm, okay. So, so you know, four ounces of chicken or, or so. Right, right. Now, no one's going to eat four ounces of chicken at breakfast necessarily. but So let's talk about some ideas for getting more protein into that breakfast, right? So let's bounce it back and forth. Like, let me tell you about this omelet I just made. This is so good. So I made a two egg omelet. And I added goat cheese because I happen to love goat cheese, but you could add any kind of cheese. I added sauteed baby spinach. I'm completely like on a baby spinach jag lately, I'm realizing. And I had seafood. I had made some tilapia the night before, just farm-raised tilapia, beautiful, baked it. I had leftovers and I flaked some up. It sounds unusual, but I'm telling you, it was so good. Flaked some of the tilapia up added that to the omelet. And then I diced up some avocado, of course, my favorite food in the world, added that. So this was an omelet with eggs, tilapia, cheese. And I literally just had it like 
half an hour ago before our interview. So delicious. So even seafood, you know, lox, right? Smoked salmon. You could have that in the morning and there's your protein. Absolutely. And that sounds amazing, by the way. I'm known to throw anything in an omelet. So fish, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, that sounds delicious. And that would likely at least hit your 20 grams. There's six grams in each egg. So you have 12 at least there between the goat cheese and the fish. You know, you likely at least hit your 20. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't hard. No, that was easy. Give me an idea, something from your book that your kids love. Oh my goodness. You know, I love protein pancakes. I think for kids, it's really easy just because they like pancakes and they can grab them with their hand, even if they're smaller kids. And they're so simple because you just make them with eggs, oats, and mashed banana and a little baking powder and whatever fruit you want to throw in there. So they're wholesome. You don't need protein powder in a protein pancake. I think a lot of people get confused and think you have to put protein powder in things to get, you know, adequate protein, and that's not true. I even top pancakes with cottage cheese or Greek yogurt instead of, you know, syrup, Mm. so that I don't need, and fruit, so that I don't need the extra sweet from syrup, but that I'm getting even more protein by adding cottage cheese or yogurt and fruit. That's the way I love to serve them. That's such Um, a good idea. Kids don't need 20 grams of protein at breakfast. That's the other thing I wanted to point out if we're Mm. we're focusing on kids a lot too, because smaller bodies don't need as much protein. I don't want moms thinking that they have to get 20 grams of protein into their, you know, six-year-old at breakfast. How much for a six-year-old? You know, it depends because depending on their weight and their age, they have different protein needs and I'm not a pediatric dietitian, so I don't want to give somebody the wrong information, but they can look up, either ask their pediatrician if they're concerned or they can look up the recommended dietary allowance tables and it should tell you for the age of the child what they need in a day and then you can just, you kind of cut that in thirds and say, okay, if I want a third of it at breakfast, you know, what would it be? But it's not a huge amount. So it's a good rule of thumb then, a third, a third, a third. And of course, there's, you know, snacking in between. And the 20 to 30 grams is for an adult who's consuming more calories. So it's really about like even that omelet that I just shared, you know, with two eggs for a little kid, it would be a one egg omelet, right? And you would just cut the amount because kids eat less kind of makes sense. So just kind of go with your gut and child size portions. Why not? What about protein powder? Like you mentioned it. If parents do buy it, I used to buy protein powder and add it to smoothies. You know, I would make smoothies for my boys with yogurt and fruit and you know bananas, and I'd add a scoop of protein powder. But if you're going to buy protein powder, are certain types better than others? It sort of depends on what you're looking for. So when it comes to children, I would just make sure it has the fewest ingredients possible because there are definitely protein powders that have a lot of things added to them. I like whey protein, particularly grass-fed whey protein, just because the fatty acid profile is a little bit better. But I buy whey protein that only has a few ingredients and a little bit of stevia to sweeten it. So I try and avoid the true artificial sweeteners. They always sweeten it with a little something just because you want the person to actually think it tastes good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there's always a little bit. Those are the brands that I tend to buy are the ones that just have a couple ingredients and a little bit of stevia. Okay, good, good. Hey, so I sort of teased this at the top of the show, but what would you consider to be a better breakfast? This plate piled high with scrambled eggs or a bowl of your favorite whole grain cereal? My answer is to mesh the two together a little bit because you want that balance. I don't only want somebody to have protein at breakfast. I want them to have some healthy carbohydrates and some healthy fat and fiber. So if you're having that egg omelet, that's fantastic. It's got protein and a whole lot of nutrients, but there's no fiber in there, right? So when we talk about breakfast, you know, as dietitians, we talk about nutrients of concern, which is a fancy way of saying the nutrients that we tend to lack in our diets in adequate amounts. And those are calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and fiber. So those four things are lacking in a lot of our diets in the amounts that we need. So in breakfast, that's a good place that you'd like to start your day consuming those nutrients. And when you look at what they are, that's going to be a whole grain bowl of cereal with milk, right? You're going to get calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and fiber. So I like to see things mixed together. That egg, while wonderful and has a whole ton of nutrients and vitamin D and choline, which is important too, that that's a nutrient that we tend not to get enough of. Yep, for brain health. Yep. Right. But you want to think of the my plate. You want to think of balancing that plate. Do I have a source of protein? Do I have a source of healthy, 
whole grain carbs and produce, some fruit or vegetable you want that protein and fiber together. One thing I would say is if you're going to have the bowl of whole grain cereal, top it with some toasted nuts, maybe pecans or almonds or walnuts, top it with some Greek yogurt, top it with some fruit. And if your kids don't like everything kind of smashed together, then have that little bowl of fruit on the side, snack on some nuts throughout the day. So there's ways to incorporate all these foods so that you're getting not just cereal and milk, but you're kind of adding to it. So I like that advice of thinking about what nutrients or what foods your family tends to miss out on, and then use breakfast as a great way to kind of start the day. And I have a hack too, because I love cereal. I'm really a cereal person. And I learned that I was starving to death in an hour after eating cereal a lot of the time, but I really enjoyed it. So I started to whisk some protein powder into my milk and then pour it over the cereal with my fruit. And now I have my healthy whole grain, my protein, and my produce and fiber. Good tip. I like that. So if your kids, let's say you have teenagers, and they're bleary-eyed, they get out of bed in the morning, and now they're rushing to catch the bus. We know teenagers don't like waking up early. So they don't want to eat breakfast. Can you give them something as they're running out the door that's not one of these store-bought bars that's like packed with sugar? What would you recommend? A grab and go. Yeah, it is tough with teenagers, I will say, especially when the bus comes at like 6.30 in the morning. I like to bake things in advance. So something like a baked oatmeal cup, you know, you can bake oatmeal in muffin tins with all different add-ins and toppings, chocolate chips or fruit or other things that they like. And instead of having to eat your oatmeal in a bowl, you can eat it in a muffin form. So that's something good to grab. Or even banana bread squares, something like that, that you make with whole grain flour. And I even add some protein powder in and yogurt and things like that when I bake so that you get that extra protein in there. That with a cheese stick or something. Very grab-and-go items that you can have in advance. A hard-boiled egg that you took the shell off of fantastic, you know, handheld food that's got protein built in and a lot of nutrients for the morning. If they don't mind their pancakes a little lukewarm, you know, you can heat up some of those protein pancakes that you made and just wrap them up in a napkin and hand it to them on the way out the door on the bus. They can eat that. If they've got a disposable cup, you can blend smoothies at night and let it sit in the refrigerator and it's ready to go in the morning, especially if it has some chia or flax in it because that'll thicken overnight so it doesn't get runny. So that works too. Mm -hmm. I have a recipe on Liz's Healthy Table for grab and go granola bars and they're made with whole grain cereal and walnuts and honey and little mini chocolate chips, just a few and dried fruit. And they are so awesome. It was actually the hardest recipe I think I ever developed because I think a lot of the homemade granola bars tend to be just too flaky and they don't hold together. So I'll make sure in the show notes that I give a link because it's my hands down favorite. Love, love, love that recipe and got my boys through so many bleary eyed mornings. I cannot even tell you. So that's a good one. So I have a closed Facebook group, the podcast Posse. I know, Lauren, you're a member of that closed group. Anybody can join it. So if you're on my show notes page in the right hand sidebar, you'll see a link that says join the posse. So I encourage everybody to head on over because I always ask people ahead of time, do you have any questions on such and such for my guest this week? And so I posed a question, do you have any breakfast questions? And so Jean, she asked, do you have any ideas on how to sneak in protein for toddlers? And Diana, another podcast posse member, she said, do you have ideas for adults too? Now I know we've sort of touched on it, but any ideas, especially, I think we've hit the adult quotient here, but what about toddlers, these little, little ones out there? How do we get more protein into their diets? Oh, that's easy. And remember, it doesn't have to be a huge amount for that little body either. But sneaking protein in for toddlers is fun. Remembering it doesn't need to be a lot. So powdered peanut butter is a winner because you can blend it or mix it into anything like oatmeal or smoothies or pancakes and kids tend to like the flavor so assuming there's no peanut allergies but we know now that for toddlers it's good to have peanuts to prevent allergies as long as they don't have an existing one Mm -hmm, so that's a really great thing to use my favorite is cottage cheese that is like my go-to protein source and it's kind of polarizing for people (laughs) because they either love it or they don't but for little kids it's excellent mixed with canned pureed or fresh fruit 
which as long as they have it early enough, they tend to like it. And it's my favorite smoothie hack because when you put cottage cheese in a smoothie, once you blend away the texture, you have a creamy high protein add in that isn't tart like yogurt. So you don't need to add sugar or sweetener to kind of counteract the tart like you would if you put yogurt in it to compensate. So that's my super smoothie trick is blending in cottage cheese. I love that tip. Wow. I actually have a cottage cheese recipe where I blend together cottage cheese, frozen mango, a couple other ingredients and make almost like a little dessert, if you will. But you could totally serve that for breakfast because it's not sweetened. It's just, you know, sweetened naturally. So I'll put a link to that in, um, in the show notes. And also tofu. People don't think of tofu, but that's a great smoothie blend in too. I just was on the wild blueberry harvest tour. I know you went on that Mm -hmm. in the past and you know, they have a smoothie making contest. So I made a vegan high protein smoothie that had wild blueberries and powdered peanut butter and tofu and some almond milk and I think flax. And I think Mm -hmm. that was it because we were only allowed five ingredients. And you know, it doesn't always have to be dairy. It can be plant-based and still be high in protein. So when you add the protein powder to that smoothie, does it taste peanutty? What was the flavor of that smoothie? It was a peanutty blueberry smoothie. Mm. So it just had a nut hint, you know, with the wild blueberries, almost like PB&J, right? Because you've got peanut butter and fruity jam Mm -hmm. type flavor. I assume you used fresh wild blueberries because you probably had just picked them. You know, we did, which was wonderful. But for the smoothies, we used frozen because we want everybody to be able to make those recipes. And you can get frozen wild blueberries year round. You just can't get fresh. I live in New England. And so every August, we can get fresh wild blueberries. They're so delicate. And so it's not something you're going to typically find at your grocery store. But when you do, you must grab it. Oh, they're so good. So good. So good. Even better when you're out in the wild blueberry barrens and you're picking, right? Why not? That was like a once in a lifetime thing. They were so delicious. We just didn't stop eating them. We were joking with them that we were, you know, eating up all their profits and blueberries. (laughs) I actually did a blog post after I went on that wild blueberry trip years ago. and, And one of the things that really impressed me, I know we're getting off on a tangent here, is that when you pick the wild blueberries, some are kind of reddish in color and tart. Some are more bluey purple in color and sweeter. They're different. They're not like so uniform because they're wild. You get this medley of flavors that come together. And that really fascinated me because, you know, when we're farming products, they tend to be very standard. Did you find that too when you were out picking that they looked different and tasted different? Oh, it was amazing. I posted all over social media about it, photos of, you know, them growing side by side, completely different colors and sizes because they were never planted. You know, they just exist in the wild and obviously the farmers manage them. But because they weren't planted, it's just what grows, grows. Mm -hmm. Love that. Hey, what are some of the typical pitfalls of the typical American diet? At breakfast, you know, breakfast in particular. Uh, Well, I mean, when you think about it, like we said, coffee, bagel or nothing, right? So when I have a patient come in and they're telling me what they had for breakfast, they'll say, oh, I had a coffee. And then when you (laughs) ask questions, it turns out it was a 500 calorie, you know, 80 gram sugar latte, but they called it coffee. (laughs) So you have to ask those questions. But those are the pitfalls, the high sugar excuse for a dessert type breakfast that really isn't nutritious, but it's calories that aren't nutrient dense. And that's really what we need to avoid. Okay. When I was growing up, my mother never served oatmeal. And as a result, when my boys were younger, I never served oatmeal. So I said to my mom, why didn't we ever have oatmeal? Because I actually love oatmeal. You know, as an adult, I discovered it. And it turns out when she was little, her mother used to make oatmeal and it was just pasty and horrible. And it just totally grossed my mom out. And she literally cannot eat oatmeal or any cereal like that. Well, thankfully, I discovered it. I like making overnight oats. 
And when I make oatmeal for breakfast, I add a little honey, some dried fruit, some cinnamon. But the other day, there was this blogger challenge. I'm in a group, I think you are too, Lauren, called the Recipe Redux, where we all get together, a bunch of bloggers, healthy food bloggers, and we cook something similar to one another because we're given this challenge. So the challenge, coincidentally, this week was to come up with a high-protein breakfast, right? Or one that at least has protein because the goal, again, is to distribute it throughout the day. So I came up with a 20-gram protein breakfast, and it was old-fashioned rolled oats that I cooked with milk. Okay, so instead of water, I used milk. And I like my oats not so, so thick. So instead of adding one and three quarter cups of milk, I added two cups because, you know, I always like to follow the package directions, but I kind of increased the milk a little bit. And then I stirred in, once it was cooked, some grated Parmesan cheese. And then I sauteed up shiitake mushrooms. I love mushrooms. And baby spinach, because remember, I'm on that baby spinach jag right now. And I then hard boiled a couple of eggs, sliced them up. And so I created these breakfast bowls with the oats, the shiitake mushrooms, the spinach, and the egg. And then you could add a little drizzle of, I know this sounds weird, but extra virgin olive oil and lemon juice on top. So no rules out there. You don't have to have sweet at breakfast. I don't know why, you know, in many cultures, breakfast is very savory, especially in Europe, right? They have a lot of roasted veggies at breakfast. They have a lot of meats at breakfast. Oh, in Korea, they eat the same foods all day long. They don't differentiate. Anyway, I love this breakfast bowl. It's on the blog. And it sort of reminded me, I was sort of inspired by it because I was in Copenhagen a couple weeks ago. And I went to a place called Gro, G-R-O-D. They don't pronounce the D, Gro. And it's a restaurant chain devoted to porridge. You would love this place. They cook all sorts of grains. I had a barley risotto with peas that was like insanely good. But it inspired me to create this savory oatmeal bowl for breakfast. Anyway, so check that out. It's on the blog. And I know you've got in your book some overnight oats recipes, right? I'm an overnight oats addict. That's my go-to. If I can't decide what to do, it's always overnight oats. I really, it's my favorite. What's your favorite combo? Do you have one? That's tough. My all-time favorite combo, because I tend to keep the ingredients around, is chocolate strawberry. So I use chocolate protein powder and cocoa powder with oats almond milk and plain Greek yogurt and fresh sliced strawberries or frozen in the winter. Actually, I'll just defrost them and use the frozen ones if I can't. Well, that sounds really good. Is there a magic number? Because I'm sort of playing with this between the oats and overnight oats and then the liquid. So the almond milk or whatever liquid you're using and say yogurt. I use a third, a third and a third. So a third a cup of oats, a third a cup of liquid and a third a cup of yogurt good to know. And then you put it, say, in a little mason jar, shake it up, pop yep. it in the fridge. I went through this phase where I was so obsessed with overnight oats that like normally I dream of coffee in the morning. Like that's the favorite part of my day is waking up, making my coffee. But when I was in my overnight oats jag, you could see I'm like totally food obsessed, which is why I've got this podcast. But I would literally just go to bed so happy because I knew when I woke up in the morning, I could have my overnight oats. Is that weird? No, because you sound exactly like me. But the funny thing is the first recipe in my book is mocha chip overnight oats. So I put your coffee into your overnight oats. Oh, yum. Double obsession. There you go. Hey, is coffee good or is coffee bad? Coffee's fine. I mean, the research actually shows that it's beneficial for certain things. I think as long as you can tolerate some caffeine, I can't. So I am a decaf girl. But as long as you can tolerate the caffeine, I think, what did the study say? Three to four cups a day is fine and even potentially beneficial. Don't quote me completely on that, but that's what's sticking in the back of my head. I would never drink three to four cups because I literally (laughs) would be like crazy. No, no, no. But I do have my one cup in the morning. And then thank goodness for the invention of the microwave because I probably reheat my cup of coffee 10 times. It's ridiculous. I like it really hot. And so I'm like back and forth, back and forth to the microwave. People are funny. We have all our little silly habits in the morning, don't we? Oh, we do. And let's remember when they say cup, they mean six ounces. So when you go get, you know, a venti, that's over three cups right there. Got it. It's all in the portion. Yeah. 
So I always love to ask my guests if they have a favorite cookbook, a book they turn to over and over again, a book that should be on everybody's bookshelf. What's your favorite? You know, I'm really not a typical cookbook cook, mostly because most cookbooks don't stick to the nutrient recommendations that I would want in my recipes. I do love Ellie Krieger's books because as a fellow registered dietitian, she cooks healthy food. So I know that it's not going to be super high in sugar, super high in fat. It's going to be balanced and healthy and nutrient rich. So I do absolutely love Ellie Krieger's books. And she's such a lovely, fantastic person. So I always like to support her. I really love all of my fellow registered dietitian cookbooks. Jackie Nugent has some awesome cookbooks with delicious recipes. So I try and uh, patronize our colleagues and see what I can come up with from their books. It's so funny you mentioned Ellie Krieger. And by the way, her recipes, when she uses fat, like us, she uses healthy fat. So I really love that about her recipes. And on my last show, I had Rebecca Scritchfield. She's the author of Body Kindness. But we were talking about back to school recipes. And when I asked her, what's your favorite cookbook? She also mentioned Ellie. And so we might have to have Ellie on the podcast because now we're, I'm seeing a trend, people. So I think we'll get Ellie on the podcast. And many, many, many years ago when I worked at CNN in Atlanta, I was a producer and reporter for them. Ellie was a summer intern at one point. I go way back with her. And so so I think I definitely need to have her on the show. And And my next question, again, I ask all my guests this, and that is, do you have I say a chef crush, but some chef or cookbook author or foodie out there who you've never met, but you dream, just like I dream of my coffee, but that you dream of meeting one day. You know, it's funny. I'm a total cooking show addict, more so not because I want to actually make the food, but because I'm a competitive spirit and I love to watch what they do and learn new combos and ideas. So shows like Chopped and Beat Bobby Flay. So, I mean, God, that Bobby Flay, how he beats everybody when it's a dish he's never made before. I mean, he's just like a cooking god. Mm -hmm. So I would love to pick his brain, I have to say. You know, I love Ina Garten, too, because my mother loves Ina Garten, and she's her absolute favorite chef, you know, the Barefoot Contessa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my mom often will make her recipes, and I make her adjust them because there's just way too much butter and and other super high-calorie things in there. But she is an amazing cook. So she's sort of a chef crush for me, even though I don't make her recipes as they are. But wow, she has some great flavors in there. She is amazing. I love her recipes. And what I love about Ina Garten is that everything works. You know how sometimes you follow a recipe and chefs tend to throw this and that together and they're not as exact because they're brilliant, right? They just know how to do it. It's hard for them to actually write a recipe because they're just not that exact. But Ina's recipes work every time. So I would agree. She's sort of an icon, and I could see why you'd love to meet her. But she's really exact. I've heard her interviewed, and she tests her recipes like 20, 30 times until she gets it exactly the way she wants it, and that's why they work. Wow. I've never heard of that. That is unbelievable. So anything else about breakfast that we haven't touched on that you would love to share? I think one point I want to make is that, you know, you hear people say all the time that they're not hungry for breakfast and that's their excuse for not eating it. And I ask them to look at their day and generally speaking, not everyone, but people who are not hungry often eat a large late dinner or they snack late at night. And that's why they're not hungry in the morning. And I assure you, if you eat dinner at 5.30 and eat nothing the rest of the night, you're going to be hungry for breakfast. So sometimes people just need to shift their day a little bit to try and make it a little bit healthier. So I wouldn't just say I'm not hungry and leave it at that. I would look at why. Interesting. So eat a little less the night before, don't have that late night snack. And then when you wake up, you'll be good and hungry. Right. Because we know metabolically, we don't need the food when the car's in the garage. We need it when we're working and doing and going about our life. So we don't want to you know, store everything in the evening. We need it in the morning. I love that advice. Hey, Lauren, how can people find you online? So my website is nutritionstarringyou.com, two R's and starring. And that's my website. Well, you'll find, you know, my blog and 
lots of recipes. And I'm also on social media at Lauren Pincus RD, P I N C U S. So Lauren Pincus RD on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, and Facebook at Nutrition Starring. Fantastic. And I'll put all the links in my show notes. I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you so much, Liz. I had so much fun. I loved having Lauren on the show. Don't forget, you can enter to win a copy of her cookbook over at Liz's Healthy Table. Just check out the show notes. Her book is The Protein Packed Breakfast Club. And of course, if you would like even more recipes, don't forget to check out my blog over at Liz's Healthy Table. Be sure to tune into all of my other podcasts. This is episode 10. And believe me, folks, we will have plenty more in the future. If you haven't written a review for me yet, if you love my show, head on over to iTunes and post a review. I would really appreciate that. You can follow me on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter. I have almost 2000 followers on Instagram. I cannot budge people. I got to get over 2,000. I'm starting to get an inferiority complex. So if you're on Instagram, please follow me at Liz Weiss. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.